Um, we've been uh, sort of giving you the, the broad view from, from Francis of what was going on, you know, NIH-wide and, and beyond. Um, Eric has focused on NHGRI. And I was asked to, to talk specifically about the series of meetings of which this is the sixth and how they kind of came to be and what's come out of them, what we hope will, will come out of them. Um, and this was uh, um, uh, part an, an outgrowth of our advisory council. Every institute at the NIH and the Office of the Director have uh, separate advisory councils, which are senior members of the scientific community uh, that generally meet about three times per year. And one of, one of the things they do is give us advice on, on scientific directions. And we have a specific working group of that group that helps us to plan these genomic medicine meetings, which began about two and a half years ago. Um, and uh, we're initially two to three of them per year, so we were having them about every four months. And that has become exhausting for us and our advisors and the, and the genomic medicine community, which is, you know, is pretty small. Um, so we may be slowing those down a little bit, but, but the, uh, the purpose of this working group was to help us to plan these meetings as well as to give us guidance on other areas of implementation such as, you know, infrastructural needs, um, uh, ideas for future collaborations, and, and reviewing the progress overall. You've met many many of the members of this group. Um, all but two are here. Howard Jacob is is stuck in Wisconsin, and if you know what it's like in Wisconsin, anybody who could have gotten out would have. Um, so he, he's watching us by uh, um, by website right now. And Pearl O'Rourke, who had an injury, unfortunately, and so she's also hopefully joining us joining us by website. But the, the rest of them are here, and you've met them. Um, if you're interested in in the activities that we're carrying on, we have a, a website. Um, if you just Google NHGRI GMWG, it will will take you right to it, which is very nice, or genomic medicine and HGRI uh, should take you as well. Um, we began this effort in June of 2011, as I mentioned, with a, a colloquium very much like this one, except it was focused on U.S. mainly academic medical centers and integrated health systems. And we basically had, had had a debate internally and with our scientific community as to whether there were people that were really ready to implement this or was it too early. And, you know, it was, it was sort of, you know, Half the, the room felt it was too early and half the room felt it was too late, and so we thought that was a good time to have a meeting. Um, and so we, we invited people to come, much like we did on this one, on their own dime, um, in their own time, to, to join us at O'Hare for a, a day. And uh, 20 groups came, many of them are, are represented here, uh, and we really were, were quite surprised and gratified to find not only that there was a lot going on, uh, but also a little concern to, to recognize that it was going on in isolation. And many of the groups were facing the same challenges, dealing with the same issues issues, coming to many of the same conclusions, but they were all doing it separately, and that didn't seem to make a lot of sense to any of us. Um, so one of the things we did was to uh, prepare a paper that Jeff re referred to um, that has in it a, sort of a, a roadmap almost for implementation. So how are the early adopter groups actually going about this? And as I was, was chatting at, uh, at coffee before we came in, several people said to me, yes, but you know, how do you really translate this? How do you get it into the clinic? Well, we think this is a start at kind of pointing you in the direction of the, of the way that some of the groups that have been successful so far have done it. Um, and in it, there's a, a little figure, um, but obviously there's a lot more to it than this. Um, but, but Dan Roden in particular helped us with this, with their PREDICT project, project and you'll hear a little bit more about his uh, related efforts that he's involved in. Um, but there are uh, a couple of key steps, having some local champions, which often in these institutions are, are the CEOs or the presidents, um, that always helps. Um, and then engaging the institutional leadership, as I mentioned, and, and a variety of other, other steps, so, so hopefully that will be of some help. Um, after the colloquium, one of the things we recognized was that every, every one of these groups was trying to figure out what variants should be reported. So what are the things that, you know, you find them and you should implement them and, and, and you know, make use of them in the clinic. And so each group was going through a process to do that. And we felt that it would be useful to try to, to harness th those efforts rather than duplicating them, say, all right, how about, you know, some groups take, you guys take neurology and we'll take GI and this group will take pharmacology and then we can pool those efforts. Uh, so we had a meeting then about six months later to figure out how we could identify uh, uh, variants that were clinically relevant and decide what should be acted upon and what that action should be. Just after that meeting, we had a second meeting where we were trying to, to uh, develop some potential collaborations among groups, and then a third uh, in May of 
this doesn't want to click, there we go, um, in, in May of, of 2012 to, uh, to look at some of those pilot projects and also to look at some of the barriers in implementation with payers, particularly major insurance companies, Aetna and Blue Cross Blue Shield and, and other stakeholders. Um, we then brought, you know, spun off of that a, a group um, specifically devoted to the payers to try to determine whether there would be some opportunities for joint funding of research projects, and we're still working in that in that area now. Um, and from these first three meetings, we actually developed these are our requests for application, which you probably have, have similar kinds of processes in your own countries. Um, that came, that sort of spun out of these, and Eric mentioned several of them. Uh, as you can see, there was quite a lot of activity in the research realm that, uh, that we were able to put forward uh, from this. This is uh, actually a self portrait of Michelangelo when he finished the Sistine ceiling. You can see his little paintbrush here. Um, and this is pretty much the way our, our staff felt after, uh, after that, that uh, year or so of getting all of those projects uh, up and underway. Um, as we were doing this, we recognized that there were also a, a large number of, of um, uh, infrastructural needs that needed to be addressed, one of which was education of, of clinicians, particularly physicians. So there had been some fairly successful efforts at, at educating pharmacists, physicians assistants, nurses, and, and those groups through the National Coalition for Health Provider Education in Genomics, or NICHPEG, um, that NHGRI had been working with closely. But physicians had been a tougher nut to crack. And one of the things we did was to, to contact the many professional organizations around the country, some of the largest ones uh, that are listed here, uh, plus obviously the College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, which would be central to this effort. And we had them you know, come to Dallas and join us in, in January of 2013. Um, just a year ago, and, and ask them, you know, how could we go about educating physicians? Is there an interest, and, and are there needs, and what could we share across groups? And, and perhaps the, the key lesson from that, and one that, that you may want to take home to, to your places as well, is that we should present this to physicians as a gradual evolution rather than a revolution. So, so I think in many ways we've kind of scared people that this is going to change everything, and it and probably will change everything, but not today. Um, and today what we have is a handful, or perhaps a few more, very variants that are useful and can be applied in clinical practice, but in many ways they're just another lab test. I mean, you test a creatinine before you give an aminoglycoside, you test a, you should perhaps, um, test a CYP variant before you give uh, a variety of drugs. So, so that was a, a real lesson to us, as well as a number of other things, and, and I should note that, that none of us are probably going through our slides in as much detail as you might like to, you know, review them in the, in the future. We will post all of these slides um, on the NHGRI website, along with the video cast of, of this presentation, uh, of this meeting. From that meeting in, in uh, uh, January of last year, we, uh, all of the professional societies agreed that what we needed was some way for them to interact in ways that could facilitate education of cl clinicians and kind of multiply their efforts without duplication. So we formed this inter-society coordinating committee. The charge was to facilitate interactions among societies that would um, enhance that education and, and actually not just enhance education, but the actual application of, of genomics to clinical care. Uh, this is a brief, um, uh, description of the structure. Um, let's see. Uh, and we have a, a series of working groups that we've, we've set up. Uh, two of the leaders of, of those, Bruce Corr from Alabama is leading the competencies group, and um, uh, Mark Williams is leading the use cases group. Uh, they're both here today. Um, but one of the things we wanted to do was to identify, well, what is it that, that physicians should know? And, and Bruce's group now has a very nice set of what, what are now called entrustable professional activities, um, or EPAs, uh, and, and those will, will be submitted for publication soon. Um, we also have uh, uh, the use case this group has developed a template of, of case studies that uh, we're hoping then each of the specialty societies will take and customize and say, okay, you know, if you want to apply pharmacogenomics in cardiology, here's a good example of how that might be appropriately done. Um, and, and that group has grown. You can see here um, the, the uh, new groups that have been added on, plus many, many of the, uh, the 27 uh, NIH institutes and centers are participating actively. So, so that was the area of, of uh, physician education. We also recognize that while many countries, particularly Britain, but others have a sort of a strategy for implementing, a national strategy for implementing genomics, we don't have that in the U.S. Um, and one of the things we thought might be useful would be to engage the many federal agencies that touch on this from a regulatory standpoint or a reimbursement standpoint or whatever, and try to get to uh, see if, if there were places that we could collaborate and, and work together to move this forward. Um, we are hampered somewhat in the U.S. by not having a, a medical care system, although 
Rob Kaler from Duke is fond of saying, if you don't think we have a healthcare system, just try to change it. Um, so, so um, and, and actually, in, in the US, we do have a couple of, of sort of direct providers of medical care, which include the, the, uh, um, the military medical systems as well as our Veterans Administration, which take care of, of millions of people. And, and they were quite interested and wanted to attend and did. Uh, we also had many of the reimbursement and regulatory groups and, and other supportive and facilitative groups that are, that are listed here. Um, one of the things we did was to survey them, much as we surveyed you, except we asked them kind of different questions. Um, and one of the questions was, what are the, are the major barriers? And it was interesting to see what, you know, what was listed by the various groups. Um, but in particular, and we've heard this over and over again, um, is evidence of clinical validity and utility. Prove to us that this works and we will use it, we will implement it, and we'll pay for it. Um, so we recognized that that was a major issue. And we also recognized that we had a, um, significant opportunity in um, particularly the, int the interest of the military medical services. So we had a lot of them show up. They were, they were quite enthusiastic and really wanted to be part of this because they're hearing from not only their patients but also um, various companies and, and others that are, are promoting um, uh, genomic medicine and they don't know what they should be doing, much like I think many of your practitioners. So one of the things we thought was, well, they're receiving a lot of pressure to, to do this. Um, they are a comprehensive clinical care system. Uh, there are, one of the nice things about the military medical system is that there is, is less of a socioeconomic gradient in care. Um, they are all, you know, conceivably getting the same care, although when you get to the very high levels, it does change a little bit, um, as it does in many systems. And there also are other advantages to using that system. So could we possibly develop some kind of an evidence generation uh, project there? And in talking with them further, the area that seemed to be um, the kind of the least controversial and the most ready was in pharmacogenomics. And so we're uh, now exploring the, the potential for actually doing a, uh, uh, some kind of a, a targeted array or other kind of project uh, in the military medical system. We don't know what this is going to look like, but it could be a very large evidence generation project. And one of the neat things about it is that there's a pilot project for this already going on um, at the NIH Clinical Center, which also is a direct provider of medical care, obviously, in a you know, much different sort of tertiary and uh, specialized format. Uh, but there's great interest in the clinical center uh, group in collaborating with the military. They've done this in, in many other projects uh, uh, to begin with. Um, and so, so this is one that we think might, might actually be able to provide some, some important um, evidence and something that we may want to think about as a, as a potential collaborative project across uh, the groups represented here. Um, we also identified with them the, the need and the importance of family history data, a, a perhaps potentially easier thing. Um, at least a little more understandable to physicians and patients than perhaps some of the pharmacogenomics. So, so we'll be working uh, forward, uh, working with that, trying to move it forward. And then there's a question of what our seventh meeting should be. We generally plan, you know, the, the, the next meeting at the, the dinner the night before the, the, um, uh, this meeting. And so we, we talked about that last night. And, and while we recognize that there's some importance in, in trying to interact more with industry, pr particularly industries that we don't usually think of in the clinical realm, such as um, some of the benefit <coughs> providers, uh, the insurance groups, as, as well as the med medical record companies in genomics, some of the sequencing companies or providers of arrays, uh, as well as, as some of the drug companies. Um, so that might be something that we would do in, in our future meeting, which would be held sometime um, in the fall or so. Um, but we also have a number of kind of irons in the fire that we need to follow up on, and, uh, and maybe we should be doing that. So, so that's, you know, kind of an open question mark. We will continue the, the open invitations as space allows, and we are very grateful to the IOM for giving us this space here in, in this lovely venue. It is a little bit more constrained than we usually use, so we apologize to those who we weren't able to include in this meeting. Um, and we will continue the video streaming as long as my colleagues uh, Alvaro and Maggie can continue to join us for it. Um, and then we'll, we'll kind of see from there. So, so I think that's all I had. Um, so I will stop there and then we'll take questions after the next speaker, which is Dan Roden. So Dr. Roden, thank you very much.